I thought about starting from what the ancient Greeks believed. Galen believed that disease was caused by an imbalance in bodily humors. And these humors, blood, black bile, yellow bile, or phlegm, these humors were actually bodily substances. They were produced by organs in the body under the control of things that could be influenced by things such as diet or activity or breathing. And the idea was that the production of these bodily substances had to be carefully regulated. But the point is, is that disease was caused when there was an imbalance in bodily substances. And what's interesting about this theory is that it was the predominant theory of disease causation in the world for uh, 2,000 years. That really stayed as the dominant theory of disease until the time of Pasteur and Bill Roth and Koch and the emergence of Pasteur's germ theory of disease. In fact, the humoral theory of disease and the humoral practice of medicine is still actually an active body of work in the Far East. In Indo-Tibetan Buddhism doctors, for instance, practice humoral medicine based largely on these ideas of balancing the production of bodily substances. But in the West, there was a relatively rapid adoption of Pasteur's germ theory of disease and recall, Pasteur didn't say all germs were bad. Pasteur said that some germs can cause disease. And from understanding that, it really became possible to start to think about diseases that were caused from agents outside the body, not from agents inside the body. And really, that concept of approaching disease as a problem of infectious agents was the predominant theory of disease causation up until fairly recently. In fact, the idea that the immune system could prevent these germs or prevent these infections in Pasteur's own work on vaccinating a child against rabies really congealed the thinking that the immune system had to be mobilized to prevent the damage that the germs caused. Throughout history, there were, as you know, recurring episodes of black death or plague or pestilence, as it was called. Nearly 20 million people died in perhaps one of the most famous outbreaks of the plague in the 14th century, which represented a third of the population of Western Europe. But if you look at the disease that occurred in the 14th century, there were really two different forms of it. One form was the bubonic plague form of the disease, which was characterized by fever, flu, um, sneezing, rash, lymphadenopathy, and a relatively high mortality, but it was not uniformly fatal. It was 35 to 70 percent mortality even back in those days. The course of this disease would play itself out over five days to two weeks. The other form of the disease, this, the septicemic form of the disease, was characterized by fever, acute shock, necrosis of hands and feet, and 100% mortality, often within 24 to 48 hours. And these were two very different disease syndromes. And of course, at the time, the pathogenesis was completely unknown, and it was called a pestilence. I would point out that the hand looked strikingly like what you can see in the emergency room of many major medical centers, even today, as a consequence of another acute shock lethality caused by, uh, in this case, meningococcemia. So in grappling with what was causing this, a Jesuit priest, Father Kircher, wrote in the 17th century that the pestilential poison was driven by the heart into the liver and the rest of the body to spoil such weak and ignoble members with a harmful inflammation. Then the poison rages within, conquers the entire body, and overwhelms him, and finally brings about death. It's interesting to think now with what we know about harmful inflammation and whether the, the good Jesuit was pressing it or not would probably be beyond the scope of my ability to know at this time. Nonetheless, after the general acceptance of the germ theory of disease, in the 19th century, there was an outbreak of plague near Vietnam. And actually, this caused two uh, separate investigators, Yersin and Kita Sato, to basically rush to Vietnam to try to be the first to identify the plague bacillus. And in fact, they competingly discovered the causative agent of plague, Yersinia pestis, which was named in honor of Yersin because he documented his case better and published in a better journal. There's a lesson there. And of course, now this really placed the final emphasis on the fact that diseases are caused by bacteria and eventually with the development of antibiotics could be treated as such, even one as bad as the pestilence or the plague. Today, we have another pestilence and it's sepsis. And the numbers are staggering, whether it's by annual cases, the mortality or cost. But sepsis is a syndrome, not a disease. In its highest grouping, it's defined as a systemic inflammatory response to infection or injury, you don't have to have infection, characterized by abnormal temperature, heart rates, respiratory rates, and white blood count. If you run around the block, you clinically have sepsis. That's a big problem if you're trying to do clinical trials.